on? We're on, we're on. Okay, hello, welcome. Hello, hello, hello. I'm really glad I can be behind this uh, podium here because I'm not wearing any pants. <laughs> no, I, I'm not, I'm wearing shorts, right? <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, welcome. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. I'm happy to be the first person to welcome you to Red Dot RubyConf. <laughs> um, I want to say thank you to everybody for coming. Thanks to the organizers. Thank, thank you, Winston. Thank you, all of you. Please give yourselves a round of applause. I'm very happy to be here. Um, one interesting thing about being the last speaker is that um, <laughs> The only thing between you and the party is me. <laughs> so I was thinking that I would just do everything uh, very as slow, as long, long as, as possible. That's actually the longest transition keynote will do. <laughs> I was also thinking maybe we would just stand around and watch animated GIFs all day. I like this one. It's pretty funny. <laughs> He's st standing there dancing. Yeah. <laughs> when is that party? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is Aaron Patterson. Um, I've come to you from the United States to bring freedom. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. <laughs> uh, do we have any Germans here tonight? Anyone from Germany? Yeah, I heard we won. <laughs> freedom. freedom, yeah. I couldn't figure out how to make any like jets fly across that or anything. <laughs> anyway, I'm on the I'm on the Ruby Core team. I'm also on the Rails Core team, um, and this is my first time to give a talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so you can find me on Twitter as Tenderlove. I'm also on GitHub as Tenderlove. Uh, Instagram as Tenderlove, and also on Yo as Tenderlove. Uh, <laughs> So you can yo me there. Um, I think about weird stuff all the time for some reason. I don't. I really don't know why. Just like, just weird stuff always comes to my mind. Like for example, people always say like separation of concerns. Like I, I heard that a lot at this conference. I hear it a lot all the time as a programmer. And the only thing that I can think of is basically this. Just. <laughs> That's all I can think of. I can't take it seriously. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, I recently became the um, number one committer on Rails. I'm the top. I'm the top. A ton of internet points. So many internet points. Uh, I think this is out of date. I, I think I actually have more commits than that now. But let me tell you, I'm going to give you all the secret to getting internet points. Uh, I'm going to give you, this is the secret, this is my secret, I'm giving it away here, is that um, revert commits count too. <laughs> so more mistakes equals more points. <laughs> so don't be afraid to make mistakes, you get more internet points for it. Uh, I'm a short stack engineer. Uh, <laughs> I think that's actually a full stack, but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a short stack engineer. I enjoy, I enjoy pair programming. That's me pair programming. Uh, the interface is a little sticky on that. Uh, getting the TTY to work was difficult. I, I guess I'm also a dad joke programmer, too. I tell a lot of bad dad jokes. Anyway, I have a cat. Uh, this is my cat. His name is Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunderhorse. Um, actually, I have two cats. This is my other cat. Uh, her name is SeaTac Airport YouTube. Uh, Facebook, too, is her name also. That's, that's her. Uh, actually, yeah, I, my wife told me the reason we got the other cat was so that, or the reason we got two cats is so that I would stop looking at pictures of cats online. And I was like, 
<laughs> like that's, that's not how this works. <laughs> you see, now we have two cats and I look at cat pictures online. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm also a very shy person. Um, I, you, might, you might think, hey Aaron, how are you getting up in front of all these people and talking to them if you're very shy? And well, it's actually because I'm really excited about my work. I love my job and I also love, like, I want people to know what I do. So I use that to like, uh, give myself the courage to be up here, but also like uh, I brought so I brought a whole bunch of stickers of my cat, and I like I am really terrible at starting conversations. I'm very shy and awkward. Uh, so if you want to come talk to me, come up and say, "Hey, Aaron, I would like a sticker," and then I'll say, "Here's a sticker of my cat," and then we can talk about cats or programming or whatever. Uh, so it's like a little icebreaker there. Um, anyway, so I was thinking about this, thinking about this conference, and I looked at like, so last year, I thought about the stuff that I did here in uh, Red Dot RubyConf last year. Last year, I went to, I went to Hawker Centers, uh, and there's amazing food. I ate some really, really awesome food. This is one of the things I ate. Um, I also thought about, like, so last year I thought about this is, uh, so this is a map of the world. I came from here. That's, I'm from Seattle in the United States there. Uh, and we're down here in Singapore. Um, and the problem is that like, I love food a lot. I love food a lot. I eat all the time and it's very, very bad for my weight. But I was thinking that, well, so I am very far north typically, right? And we are now pretty far south. And if we take a look at the Earth from the top, like there on the right, that's where I am in Seattle. And down there on the, on the bottom right, that's, in, that's us in Singapore. And actually the Earth is, you know, the Earth has the same, we're rotating faster down here than we are up in Seattle. So I should be being flung away from the Earth faster, like if we move that up there, right? So that means that down here in Singapore I weigh less. Uh, because I'm being pushed away from the earth, right? So I was trying to calculate this, I was trying to figure this out, and I thought, okay, there's, <laughs> there's all that, and I'm like, okay, let's plug in some numbers here, and I plug in these numbers, and I'm plugging them in and trying to figure it out, and then I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, I couldn't figure this out, but I, like, this is all, I was trying to figure this out last year, too. I, I couldn't figure it out last year, and actually, like, one of my fond memories of this conference from last year was, um, talking to Jim Weirich about this, uh, and he actually calculated all of this for me and presented it in his slides and told me exactly how much weight I lost when I was down here. And I was digging through, digging through um, old photos that I took from last year, and I found this one where he was comparing himself to my cat. <laughs> so anyway, I just, like, I wanted to have a slide in here that just said, we miss you, Jim. Um, he is, so, he was a huge, a huge inspiration to me, and like one of the reasons I try to do my best presenting is because I know that he enjoyed watching me speak, so I'm doing my best all the time now to try and remember him. Uh, the other thing, another thing that I did last year is I ate durian fruit for the first time. Uh, and this is, this is a picture of the durian fruit that I ate, and I actually really liked it. I enjoyed it. At first I thought it smelled incredibly bad. Uh, and then I tried it and I got it and I thought it was great. It was great. That's me the first time I had it. Uh, and my wife came with me too and she tried it as well. And so I was like taking some reaction shot photos. So I've got like, this is her before, before eating durian fruit and then after. <laughs> so she didn't really enjoy it as much as I did, but uh, I really like it. Anyway, I've also been, I've been studying Node.js a lot lately. Uh, yeah. And the reason I'm doing, the reason I'm studying Node is so that I can get a lot closer to the metal. Uh, and I, I think that I've accomplished that. <laughs> I, pretty close, pretty close to the metal now. <laughs> anyway, so I'm gonna talk, my talk is called Speed Up Rails, Speed Up Your Code. Um, but I guess really it should be called Rails.inspect. <laughs> um, or maybe this is not magenta, <laughs> something. So uh, I'm going to talk a lot about I'm going to talk a lot about performance in Rails and um, performance in your own code, like basically benchmarking stuff, how to benchmark stuff, how to measure performance of your applications. Um, and I, I have an ulterior motive for teaching you how to measure measure performance of your applications, and I will talk about that at the very very end of this talk. Um, 
But basically, we're going to look at how to measure performance of code and then how I measure performance of Rails and how we've increased or uh, improved performance of Rails. Uh, and hopefully, we can take that. You'll be able to take these tools that I show you home and apply them to your code at home, be it Rails or not. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is performance trade-offs. And typically, when we're talking about performance, we have to make trade-offs. We have to think about we have to think about two things: speed versus memory. Um, we typically care about like I typically care about runtime speed, like how fast my program runs versus memory, because it's pretty easy for me to buy more RAM and throw it in a machine. It's getting che cheaper. Uh, RAM is pretty cheap. I think. Uh, we also have to talk about time versus space. So when I say speed or memory, I'm actually talking about time and space. So I think it is really interesting terms because I just think about Star Trek then. Like, so we have Q representing time and Picard representing space for some reason. I don't know. I just, whatever. Anyway, so the point is that space is not free because you know we may, we may be able to add more memory to our machines, but it's still not free, it costs something, it costs some RAM, but time is also not free because maybe we wanna serve up requests quickly. And really what the thing, the, the point of this is is that you know, nothing is actually free. We have to make a decision when we're trying to improve the performance of our systems, whether we choose, we choose Q or whether we choose Picard. Or there's actually one, there's one other thing that we can do. We can find a better algorithm. Sometimes there's certain cases where we're able to improve both of these, but uh, I find that to be pretty rare. We'll find, there's gonna be an example of that in my slides. We'll find, we'll find a mystical unicorn in these slides, but I think that this is a pretty rare, uh, rare thing that we can do. So most of the time we're making trade-offs. Most of this talk will be making trade-offs. And most of the time, we're going to talk about giving up RAM for improving the speed of our system. Uh, so RAM is cheap for us web developers. Sorry, Heroku. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> uh, so we're going to focus on runtime speed. We're going to focus on speed at the cost of RAM. And the point that I'm trying to make here is that time and space are related. We can typically trade one for the other when we're talking about performance of our applications. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to look at is performance tools. So uh, this, this is basically the advertising section of my presentation where I'm advertising other people's tools because I have no idea how to build this stuff. I am just using it to make our code better. So yes, advertisement time. So one of the tools that I like to look at for raw performance, like first we're going to look at raw performance. This is when we have like two, two bits of code. Um, and we just want to know how they compare to each other with speed, like which one of these is faster. And my go-to tool for this is a gem called Benchmark IPS, and I'm going to show you, show you how to use that with your code. But first, we're going to compare that to Benchmark that comes with Ruby Standard Library. This is a benchmarking tool that comes in Ruby Standard Library. It looks exactly like this. You say, like, create a new benchmark and run some test n times. Right, you may, have written, you may have written a benchmark like this before. Uh, now the problem is, like, if, if you've written a benchmark like this before, you might notice one of the problems is, well, how big do I make n? You'll sit there and you'll like say, oh, okay, well, maybe I may need to make a 10, or maybe I need to make it a 1,000, I'm not exactly sure. So you run it, and this may look pretty familiar to you, you run it, and it's like, wow, that's super fast, it took zero time. <laughs> well, obviously it did not take zero time. Uh, it probably took more than that, and your n was not large enough for you to study the performance of this, um, study the performance of this method. The other problem is that we have to deal with noise on our machines, like, you might be sitting there running your benchmarks, but you've also got iTunes going and Twitter running and that YouTube video as well, like, and you have the Nyan Cats going trying to get that high score. And it, this is causing a lot of noise with your benchmarks. So it would be nice if you had some sort of standard deviation to tell you, like, hey, this is, it took at, lo at longest this amount of time and at least this amount of time. So we can say it's kind of in the middle here. And this is where benchmark IPS comes in. So, what Benchmark IPS says is like, okay, let's figure out the iterations per second. That's where IPS comes from. It says like, okay, how, many, how fast can I run this code in five seconds? So we have an example here where we're comparing uh, set time, how fast can we access a set versus how fast can we access an array? Like, is this a member of an array or a member, uh, member of a set? And if we compare those two, we'll see that uh, accessing the set is much faster over there on the right, right hand side, we have iterations per second, so we can say like the number, the higher this number is, the better it is. 
how fast can we do that per second? So a set include is about, I don't know, some big number, I'm not sure, 30 bajillion, uh, and then is that a number? I don't know. And then array.include is like this, which is smaller. I can tell it's smaller because it's shorter. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm using the same size font. Uh, <laughs> so since the set, the set include is higher, that means that using a set in this particular example is better than using an array. So the point to take home from this is for iterations per second, higher is better. Just remember that higher is better. The other important thing that this provides is a standard deviation. So we can say like, well, if we, if we, uh, this, at the slowest, this could be 12% slower or 12% faster on either side of this particular number. And the reason that this is important is maybe you've implemented some algorithm uh, two different ways and you're not sure if one is faster than the other. Maybe you run it one way and it seems faster. But if you don't have this standard deviation, it could just be noise in your system. Like maybe this time you're not watching, you know, YouTube videos and listening to iTunes when you run this benchmark. So if we compare this, like, the, I want to drive this home by comparing this benchmark using the benchmark library from Ruby standard lib. This is the same, same uh, benchmark as like, well, except, uh, excuse me, not the same benchmark. We're doing set inclusion versus hash inclusion and comparing those two. They should be roughly the same. We would think that. It's roughly the same. And if we run this with standard libs benchmark, we might get an output like this, and you'll see that they look almost exactly the same or that set access is faster. And you say, well, okay, set access is faster than hash access. How can that be possible? Because if you look under the hood, set is actually wrapping up hash, so you should have a little bit of overhead in there. If we run this with benchmark IPS, we'll see, this is the same benchmark using uh, benchmark IPS, we'll see the output looks like this, um, and the hash access is actually faster th for this particular benchmark. So we get a better idea of what our numbers are using this, and we can graph this and see like, okay, well, set access is up there at whatever number, hash access is even higher, so we know iterations per second higher is better, we plot our standard deviation. The standard deviation, the bottom of the standard deviation on the right side doesn't even touch the one on the left side, so we know for sure that the hash access is faster in this particular case. Uh, the other thing I like to use these benchmarking tools for is black box testing. So many times when I'm dealing with Rails source code, like, I don't know how something is implemented. I have no idea. Uh, this might be a surprise to you, but even when I'm looking at Rails core, I'm, I'm on the Rails core team, but much of the time I have no idea what's going on. I really don't. Uh, and I try to figure this out, and one of the tools I use for figuring out what is going on is benchmarking tools. And I'm going to show you a short example of this. Is, let's say we have two cache implementations, cache one and cache two, and we're just measuring how fast it is to access, access uh, an element from our cache. Uh, so what we can do is say, well, I want to I want to study how one cache, or I want to study how these caches perform as the size of the cache increases. What we can do is say, okay, let's let's look at how big the cache is at 10, 100, 1,000, and then 100,000, depending on those particular sizes, and we can actually collect a report. Uh, IPS will return to us a report object that takes that collects this particular information. So I can take this information and compile it down, so this is code to compile that down. What I do is I say, okay, well I want to know uh, how fast it is for me to access this particular cache 10,000 times. So I have a fixed number, I want to say how fast does it take for me to get, to do a get 10,000 times. Well, IPS gives us iterations per second, so we'd say one over iterations per second to convert that to seconds per iteration. Then we multiply by 10,000 to say, okay, I want to know how fast this is for 10,000. And then we plot that. We say, okay, for each of those particular tests, how fast is this? So we plot that out and we say, okay, well, our cache one, as we grow, our cache one seems to stay the same, the same the entire time. It's constant time. Where the other one seems to be growing and it's, it may be, may be linear growth, maybe exponential growth, we're not sure exactly, but one of them is definitely constant time, the other one is growing. And if we look at the cache implementations, it's pretty obvious. The reason it's pretty obvious why we get these performance uh, differences, it's because one of them is using a hash as the internal data structure, where the other one is using an array, and we know that with an array, it's gonna take a linear amount of time to scan that array, so that's why we see those numbers grow like that. 
So I'm going to show you a real world example of using this when I'm trying to figure out what is going on with Rails. Um, one of the things that I was trying to study is like, well, how is the performance of the routing system? Like, what is, what is the routing system like? Like, how fast does it take? Let's study how fast it takes to generate a link to. So when you say link to, how fast, how long does it take to generate an A tag? So what I did is I said, okay, let's create a small, a small route set here. We'll add one resource to it. Uh, and then we'll time how fast it takes to generate an A tag. Then we'll do that again for 10 routes. So we'll add 10 routes to this. This is actually 10 resources. Then we'll do it again for 100 routes. And uh, the reason I said resources is because resources actually adds like four, a million routes. I'm not sure how many. It adds more than one. Um, and then we'll do it for 1,000. And then we'll plot that and see like how does that, like how does this change? How many iterations per second can I do as we grow the number of resources in our system? So if we plot that out, it looks like this. So along the x-axis there is the number of resources that we have in the system, and along the y-axis is the number of seconds per 100,000 calls. And if we plot this, as we grow the number of routes, it stays about linear. It's a linear performance. This doesn't actually grow as we, as we uh, get larger. Now the next thing I said is like, okay, so we know we know that the Rails router, it doesn't matter how many routes we add to the router, it'll always take the same amount of time to generate an A tag. Well, what about the size of the URL? Like, how, how long can the URL be? So I wrote another benchmark here that said, okay, well, let's, let's say, like, I want to generate a slash A slash um, ID, I think is what this is doing. Uh, or no, this is just slash A, and then I want to say, like, okay, so this one says slash A, and then this one says slash A, 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 like 10 A's. Then the next one is 100 A's. And we keep growing that and we say like, okay, how long does it take to generate a URL that's, you know, 10 of length 10, 100, 1,000, et cetera. And then we plot that using our um, iterations per second, calculating how many seconds does it take to do 100,000 100, calls. And we see like this along, along the uh, x-axis again is the number how long that URL is, how many segments are in that URL. On the very right is the 24 segments. And then along the y-axis is the number of seconds per 100,000 calls. And we see the longer that the URL gets, the longer it takes to generate the A tag. So now we kind of know what the algorithms are going, in so going on inside the, inside the routing system. We probably have some sort of hash table that keeps track of all of the uh, that keeps track of the particular routes in the system so that we can look them up and generate A tags. And we have maybe some sort of array that's actually calculating this A tag, or calculating the URL part or the href part of the A tag. So we kind of know what, what's from a high level what's going on under the hood. The next thing I want to know is like where is time spent exactly? Like, so this is great. We're able to use IPS to figure out like how fast two particular algorithms are. But what about like where is the time actually being spent? And for that, I like to use this tool called StackProf. You should check this out. This is a profiling, or this gives you, it's a sampling profiler. So it says like, okay, uh, every clock tick, every constant tick, we say, what, what is our stack frame? So the idea is that um, s functions that are slower have a higher probability of being there when we hit that clock tick, right? So if you have a method that's called, the other implication of this is that let's say you have a method that's called 100 times, it may not show up in your profile 100 times. It'll show up uh, less. It'll show up the number of times it was actually sampled. So if we run profiling for URL4, similar to the link2, we can see the results. Like this dumps out that profile to a file called URL4.dump, and we can actually view those results using the stackprof, uh, stackprof binary on our in the terminal and say, like, just give me a report of this. And this is what the report looks like. Uh, you don't need to read that too closely, but what it is is it's saying, like, at the very top there, we're spending about 26% of our time in this method called URL4. So that's where we want to focus our attention when we're trying to improve performance, is we have this one function that takes 26% of our time. Let's go look at that function and focus on that to, in order to make our code faster. The next thing I like to look at is uh, gc.stat. I think Koichi wrote this. Koichi, did you write this or was it not? Okay, Koichi wrote this. He should advertise this more, it's really awesome. Uh, I like to use this. This method gives you statistics about the garbage collector. So one thing that I need to know when I'm profiling Rails or making it faster is how many objects do we create? So gc.stat will say like, okay, 
I can ask it, how many, how many objects have we allocated in this process? So this says, how many objects have we allocated so far now? And this is a total. So this number is always incrementing. If you allocate a new object, this will go up by one. It's always incrementing. So what I can do is I can say, okay, uh, I'm gonna say how many objects are in the system now? I'm gonna run some code. I'll ask how many objects were allocated again later, and then I can just subtract those two to calculate how many objects a particular chunk of code allocated. And we, I'm doing that in this particular example. Like I wanted to find out how many objects does it, do we use for allocating uh, active record objects, or how many, how many Ruby objects do we allocate? So the first thing I did is I warmed up the system, and the reason I did this is because we have a bunch of caches. So we don't wanna take these caches into account. Uh, so I warm up the system, then I count the, number of, count the number of objects, the total number of objects that have been allocated in the system. Then we run a benchmark and say like, okay, n times, let's look up this person object n times, then count the number of objects in the system again, and then subtract and divide by n, and then we know the number of object allocations it took per call. So a real world example of this is for benchmarking views. I was very interested in how many objects were allocated every time we calculated a view. So this is the benchmark I used for that, and I said, okay, we're, we're creating a new uh, Rails application. What I did here is uh, this particular benchmark benchmarks the application but cuts out the uh, middleware, or excuse me, not the middleware, the web server. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this and not using just a rack middleware or one of the, um, oh, what is it, the performance stuff that's included with Rails is basically because that stuff is lying to you, uh, to be frank. Uh, the way that I'm doing this benchmark is I said, okay, I'm gonna create a real application, I'm gonna send one request through that, and I'm gonna record the environment, the rack end hash, and I'm gonna re later replay that. And the reason I'm saying the other ones are lying to you is because they're not actually instantiating all of the rack middlewares that are in the rail stack. Also, they're mocking out certain things like the session. So you're testing, you're testing the performance of a mock session rather than your real session. So you don't know for sure what your real numbers are. You know in this thing that maybe kind of acts like your, acts like your real system but doesn't. I wanted to get something that was as close to a real system as possible. And the reason I'm cutting out the web server is because I'm not responsible for the web server. I can't improve the performance of the web server. I'm improving the performance of Rails. And also maybe Puma performs better than Unicorn or doesn't. You can choose a different web server and plug it in depending on which one performs better. So what this benchmark does is it benchmarks books new. So this just has a books resource, benchmarks books new. What we do is we, uh, First, instantiate the application, then run one request through it in order to warm up any caches. Then we run this, then we run our actual benchmark, which is very, this is very similar to what we were looking at previously, only this is with a Rails application. And then we plot that. So this says like, how many objects does it allocate per request? And what I wanna show you is how we've improved over time or how Rails has improved over time. Like if we look at this graph, this is a graph of the objects allocated per request Along the y-axis there is the branch, so on the left is 4.0 stable, then 4.1, then master, and you can see that we're dropping there. And one thing that I wanna point out about this graph is that uh, we're actually starting at 2,000 right there. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I wanna teach you in this talk is how to lie with graphs. <laughs> 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 so if we actually make that very bottom zero, the graph looks like this, and you're like, ah. <laughs> that doesn't feel very good. But, but the good news, the good news is that we have about a 19% reduction in objects since 4.0, or 4.0 stable, and a 14% reduction in objects since 4.1 stable. And later in the talk, we're gonna look at why that is, or how we, how we got those, um, how we got those performance improvements, and we're also gonna talk about why, um, well, it does matter, but it doesn't actually matter. Uh, it does matter, but I'll, there are many caveats, and we'll go over some of those. The next thing, the next tool that I like to use is this gem called Allocation Tracer, also written by Koichi. Uh, this, is, this is a tool for uh, finding where objects are allocated in your system. So you can use this, use this gem, you give it a chunk of code, and you can say like, Tell me, uh, tell me what type of objects have been allocated and where they've been allocated and how many times they've been allocated, or also GC'd as well. Uh, so here's a very short example. It's like, all right, 
we had give object allocation trays for a block of code, run some stuff in there, uh, we allocate an array a thousand times, a string and a hash, and then we say like, okay, tell me the number of, tell me the total number of allocations that happened inside that block and give me a breakdown by type of object. So if we run this code, we'll see the output looks like this. I've greatly reduced the amount of output. It's actually a lot more than this, but it really wouldn't fit on a slide. But you can see like we have a thousand strings, a thousand arrays, and a thousand hashes, like you would expect from that code. So the next thing I wanna talk about, we've looked, at, we've looked at a bunch of benchmarking tools, and these are most of the tools that I use for uh, benchmarking Rails and Rails applications. And these are also all the tools that I use for making the performance improvements that we're gonna talk about. Uh, and the first one I wanna talk about is speeding up active record. So we've done some work, excuse, <laughs> we, <laughs> me. <laughs> I have done a lot of work to speed up active record. <laughs> uh, the stuff I'm gonna talk to you about is actually about three years of my work. So uh, I spent about three years on this particular project. All the, all the stuff that I'm gonna talk to you about today is three years worth of work. And it actually sucks because I have about 30 minutes left and I'm trying to compress three years of my blood, sweat, and tears down into less than 30 minutes. <laughs> Uh, so first, in order to talk to you about these performance improvements, we need to talk about how Active Record works. So this is from a high level how Active Record works. Let's say you have a, you're doing a post.find. Uh, what we do is we say, we take that post.find and we turn that into a tree of objects called Active Record Relations. This has nothing to do with Errol. Uh, except that we take those Active Record Relations and then we turn them again into a different tree this time using Errol. Errol is actually a representation of the uh, SQL statement that we're going to execute. Uh, it's an AST of the SQL statement. So we take those active record relations, construct an AST. From that AST, we compile it down into a string. That string is a select from. That actually gets sent down to the database. The database responds with some records. We turn those into active record base and then return those back to you. So this is from a high level, how, a high level view how active record works. Uh, so part one of this performance improvements was basically bind parameter introduction. And you may have noticed this, I think, in 3.1 or 3.2. Before 3.1 or 3.2, you'd see in your logs like stuff like this. So if you did post.find1, you'd see a SQL statement that looked like this. Um, and what's interesting about this, these statements is that the only thing that changes in these SQL statements are actually these numbers, the IDs that were passed in. Now, in later versions of Rails, I think, think 3.1 or 3.2 and up, uh, you'd see something that looks like this, where we'd say, okay, select star from posts where ID equals question mark, and you'd see like some square brace ID and some number. And what this was is we were introducing bind parameters to this. The point, the point of introducing bind parameters was to separate static and dynamic content. So we have this SQL statement that's mostly static, and then we have a little bit of dynamic content. The theory, the theory being that well, if we, look at this, if we look at this view of how active record works, these things that generate the SQL statement, this active record relation, every time we're executing this active record relation and these error statements all to compile down to the SQL statement, if that SQL statement is always the same, if all of those calculations are always the same, then we should be able to calculate all of that. If the SQL statement is the same every single time we run this, why are we doing the calculations over and over again? We should be able to cache that particular computation. So step two, that was the theory. It did not exist in part one. It was just a sparkle in my eye. Um, so part two is about code decoupling. And unfortunately, we have very complex code. I'm gonna show you some code, and I want you to read this, I want you to read this code example very closely. Uh, it's very important here. Uh, <laughs> It's all readable, you can read that in the back, right? <laughs> so, obviously don't read this. What's important here is these, this, this is one method. That is one method, it's one method. And what those arrows are pointing at, those arrows are embedding dynamic content into our SQL statement. So, we wanted to get rid of that dynamic content. If we ever hope to cache these calculations, we need to get rid of that dynamic content. So the only way that we could do this is by refactoring, re why do I keep saying we? <laughs> the, only, <laughs> the, only 
only way to do this is to refactor this so that we could extract those, extract those dynamic values. And this, every time I stare at this function, I just thought of Lord of the Rings, one method to rule them all and legacy code find them. So <laughs> the way to reduce the complexity of this particular method was, what I did is I removed has and belongs to many. I am sorry, it is gone. But it's not actually gone, don't worry. If you upgrade your Rails applications, the method has and belongs to many actually exists still. But what we do is we translate that under the, under the hood to a has many through. The reason we can get away with this is because has and belongs to many actually is has many through, if you think about it. So has many through has three tables, but so does has and belongs to many. It's just that in the has and belongs to many case, we don't, we don't have a middle model there. So what we do now is whenever you call has and belongs to many, we generate an anonymous middle model. Uh, so if you dig around in the core of Rails and you find that middle model, don't touch it. Um, <laughs> we generate that model and then your, your has and belongs to many are now translated into has many through. And actually, uh, what, this is one, of, I'm just showing you this, this is one of my favorite diffs. Um, it's just all red, we're deleting stuff, deleting stuff. It uh, just made me super duper happy. The reason it made me really, really happy is because we're deleting a whole bunch of conditionals. They're just, these conditionals just went away. Now we don't have to think about has and belongs to many anymore in our code. We're able to get rid of that and it made extracting that dynamic content much easier. So part three of this was now that we've got that dynamic, that static and dynamic content separated, we can introduce a cache. So I'm gonna show you an example of this uh, cache code. This is, a, this is our cache code example. What it is is we generate an active record relation object here. So we say, okay, person.where name, uh, with some bind parameter, we limit it to one. This creates an active record relation object. It's a relation object. And what we do down here is we're able to execute that same relation object multiple times, but using different values. So we're able to execute it with Aaron and with Ebby, and it'll go against the database, but it actually only executes that block once. It calculates that relation only once. So we generate a cache object, we calculate a cache object from this relation, this relation. I'm gonna show you what the cache object internals are because this is uh, fairly important to people upgrading and to people who are watching their memory and also to us on the Rails team. Uh, the, the cache object internal looks like this. Uh, we keep a list of the bind parameters. The reason we, we keep a list of these bind parameters along with columns is that we need to be able to typecast things. So let's say uh, when you do person.find, you'll typically pass in params ID, right? And that ID when it's coming in from the URL is actually a string and we need to know how to typecast that before we send it off to the database. So we, we, look, at, we look up the ID column and we say, ah, the ID column is an integer and you've bound this particular place to an integer, so what we're gonna do is whenever you pass in an object in that particular place, we're gonna cast it to an integer before we send it to the database. The other thing that we cache is the compiled SQL. So this is actually the SQL statement that's sent to the database, and that's it, it's just a string. So we take this cache object, we have a higher level cache, uh, and by the way, that code, that code that I showed you on the previous slide, this cache stuff does exist internally to Rails, don't touch it. <laughs> You can use it if you want to, uh, but it's absolutely not supported. We may change the API at any moment, but you can do exactly the same things I'm showing you, um, but don't tell anybody I said you could do that, please. This isn't being recorded, is it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we did next is we, uh, we, 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 I, <laughs> I updated the internals to use, to cache these particular relation objects. So where can we use this cache? Where? Let's look. Things that use relation objects, post.find, post.find by SAR, has many, has many through, has and belongs to many, belongs to, actually I'm missing one from the list is post.find by and then you pass in a hash there. That, that syntax as well uses the use relations. I omitted that from the list for some reason. Um, but all of these are cacheable. They're all cacheable. Uh, so I'm gonna show you an example implementation. This is from very similar to what we have inside of Rails. So for person.find, this, this is part of the implementation for person.find. If you look at this, we'll see right, right there in the middle, we have a relation object. And you can see we're, we're saying where the primary key is equal to some bind parameter and we limit that to one. So this code looks almost exactly like what you would write in your controller. You might say post.where id limit one. We're actually using this in our internals. 
So then the next part that you'll see down here is the ID parameter. This is our dynamic parameter. This is the ID that you passed in to post.find. So we pass that in and we execute it. And uh, just as a, si a fun, fun side note, uh, there are many different ways to that you can call post.find, and I'm going to show you the many different ways. You can call it with uh, an integer, you can call it with an array, with an array of an arrays, with a hash of integers, you can, pull, you can call it with another active record object, you can call it with an integer with a block, you can call it with a scoping inside of a block. Uh, and those last two, you can call it with any combination of those ones above it on those last two as well. I just didn't want to put that many heart points in my slides. And the fun thing is that, that only that top one is cacheable. That's the only one that's cacheable. The rest of these, I have no idea, I have no idea what they're even used for. What is it, I, I don't even know what they mean. <laughs> it, anyway, so what's very annoying about this is that if you go look at the, the implementation of find today in active record, you'll find this, this giant conditional that's like, okay, if we got a block, if we got an array, if we got all this other stuff, then we can't cache it. If we slimmed down our API and got rid of those things that I don't even know what they're for, if we got rid of those things, we could just delete this code. It would just go away. It would be gone. And we could just have caching all the things all the time. So let's, let's look at the performance of Active Record now after these, these changes have been applied. These changes are in master today, uh, and they'll be coming out with Rails 4.2 whenever we release that, which I think is this year sometime. Uh, so let's look at post.find and find by name. And what I did is I, I executed these two, uh, I benchmarked these two together, and the reason I did that is because they're essentially the same thing. One is finding by ID, one is finding by name. The queries should be mostly the same. Uh, and I also chose these particular forms because this code, these two lines actually work all the way back to Rails 2.3. So I was able to take this code and benchmark it against Rails 2.3 through every single version of Rails all the way until today. Uh, and this is what it looked like. So if we go from 2.3 stable all the way over to the right hand side, which is the experimental branch, you'll see that for post.find, the number of calls per second, it actually decreased from 2.3 stable. So this is iterations per second like we talked about earlier, so higher is better. So we started out higher with 2.3 and we actually went down through the 3.0 series and we came up a little bit through 4.1 stable and then we increased here on the experimental branch by a lot. And if we look at the same thing for post.find by name, if we look at the calls per second there, we'll, we'll see that it goes way down, way down there into the three series, comes back up a little bit. And then on master, we just increased a lot. Uh, and one thing that I thought was actually very interesting is that if we look at calls per second with MySQL, so I'm calling out MySQL in particular, um, there was a strong bias towards MySQL in the, in the Rails 2.3 days. MySQL was much faster than the other databases, and I think this is just because most people used MySQL back then, but now Postgres is a million times better. Uh, use Postgres, please, because it is awesome. Uh, so if we look, at, we look at MySQL, you can see d way down here, like super sadness in the 3.1 and 3.2 series. It's just super duper sad. Uh, <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> Seriously, like what? <laughs> anyway, so we went way down and then come way back up here and you'll see that it's actually faster. It's faster today on master than it was in 2.3, but only slightly faster. It is faster, but slightly faster. And if we look at the percent faster than 4.1 stable, this is, this is what it looks like, the percentage faster than 4.1 stable. Uh, so you can see we're faster all the way across the board for every single database than 4.1 stable. If we look against 2.3 stable, we'll, again, we're faster across the board, but not much faster for MySQL. The other thing that we looked at is object, object allocations per call. So if we look at object allocations per call, you'll see like they went way up in the 3.1 series. And we can't say necessarily that allocating more objects caused the runtime to go down. It doesn't have a one-to-one -one, one -one mapping because maybe the garbage collector is faster. We can't say that these are absolutely correlated, but it does, have, it does cause your process to do more work. So you can see these objects allocated went way up and then came way back down. Same thing, the same thing with find by name. And when we look at these numbers, we find that actually Rails master today creates 70% fewer objects than 4.1 stable when you do a post.find, and 55% fewer objects when you do uh, than 2.3 stable. So I think that this is a really good, a really good achievement. Uh, the next thing I want to look at is belongs to. We can see the, 
exactly the same performance with belongs to. It goes down for the 3.0 stable and then way, it spikes way up. And then if we look at belongs to percentage faster than uh, 2.3 and 4.1 stable, we're just faster across the board. Uh, and there's not a number for MySQL2 because MySQL2 didn't work, it didn't exist on 2.3 stable. Again, we'll look at has many and has many through. Exactly the same things here where we've improved so much. Uh, this is has many calls speed over time. Again, same, same sort of graphs with has many through. It looks nearly the same. Uh, percent faster than 2.3 stable. Again, much faster, much faster than 4.1 stable. The next thing I really wanted to look at is I wanted to look at has many through growth. So what I mean by has many through growth is like, let's say we have a has many through, like a has many through relationship here, right? What happens if we add another has many through relationship? And then another has many through relationship, and another one, and another one, and another one, and we measure that performance as the number of has many relationship, or has many through relationships grows. What does that look like? So if we look at the time it takes to make 100,000 calls to a particular has many through relationship and we plot that, we'll see that it looks like this. So 4-1 stable is going across, going linear, or linearly increasing, whereas the bottom one master is just constant time. This makes me extremely happy because it's my golden unicorn of constant time, <laughs> constant time improvements. So I'm really excited about this. The TLDR to take home from this is that we're about 100% faster. Uh, <laughs> and I does, over 9,000, 9,001% better. <laughs> so challenges, the challenges for this was that we had to trade, we had to trade memory for speed. It's pretty clear because we are keeping these cache objects around. And so I wanted to think about how, we, how much memory are we trading. So I'm gonna give you a very simple formula for calculating how much memory that we're trading and unfortunately I can't tell you. Uh, this, is, this is the formula, I can't tell you exactly. But if we can calculate our, our total cache size to be about the number of find by calls that you do in your system or find by hash, that number, uh, the number of those multiplied by the size of the cache object. So I can't tell you exactly what the size of the cache object is because it depends on the size of your SQL query. Uh, and I can't tell you how many find buys you have in your system. But the important thing is that it should be bounded. If it's not bounded, then you have a problem. Not bounded would mean that a user can say like, can query against a user to find, a, or that somebody could pass in a column from the URL and that might be bad. You probably don't want users to say like, I don't know, query by whatever they want to. These, this cache size should be bounded. Now the next question is, can we, can we cache raw relations? So lots of people ask me like, hey Aaron, uh, you were able to make post stop find fast and find by ID fast and all that fast. Why can't you just make, why can't you just make post dot where dot where dot where dot where fast? And my question is, why don't you make it faster? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anyway, so let, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's look at an example controller. Uh, here's an example controller where we say person dot where, find by name, and then get a list back of people by name. So why can't we make this faster? Uh, people say like, w we wanna know, can we make this faster? Can we cache this particular thing? And the answer is we can cache this. We can cache that. We can make that faster. So I put together an experimental branch that, that attempts this. And I'm gonna show you the performance difference between the two and talk about the complexities with both of them. So let's say we have this experimental branch. Uh, we can see this is again iterations per second, so higher is faster. The experimental branch is faster. We cache that, it's faster, it's faster than master, we're happy, it's about 30% faster, okay? The problem is, the problem is each time you call a method on a relation object, that impacts the cache key. So if you say dot where, dot select, dot include, dot whatever, dot whatever, dot whatever, we have to take all of those particular values into account when we calculate the cache key. So let's look at the code on the experimental branch. This is, up there in blue is the cache key calculation and down there in red is the actual query execution. So what I found is that there's about over 11 variables impact the cache key. There's 11 different ways that you can change, that you can change a relation object, and I'm being conservative. I'm not 100% sure that that's correct. 
So that code that I showed you, that code only handles two types. That code only handles two of those variables. Imagine if it handled all 11 of those. It may be that calculating the cash key might be way more expensive than actually, than bothering with it. I mean, why bother if it's so expensive to calculate the cash key? So I did one more experiment. I'm gonna do one more experiment. Finder comparison. So what this is, is this, this is a benchmark that runs where name versus find by name. Uh, and this is against the experimental branch that has both uh, the performance improvements that we talked about earlier, along with uh, the performance improvements in post.where, person.where. I compared those two. And if we look at that, we run this. This is, again, iterations per second, so higher is faster, or higher is better. On the right side is find by name. On the left side is doing uh, post.find. This is even with our new caching code put into place, and still, Find by name is three times faster than the previous version. So the reason that it's so much faster is because even though we can cache that stuff, every time we execute that particular block, we have to create a new active record, a new active record relation object. We always have to do that. So the question is, should we even cache these relations? Should we bother with this code? And I'm not sure. I don't know that we should. I personally, I don't think we should. I don't think the complexity is worth it. What I would, what I would prefer is I would prefer we have a new, we introduce a new API, and the new API would look something like this, where we say, okay, uh, let's cache a query. Let's have a cached query. We'll put a relation, we'll create a relation object inside that, and we'll cache that, and then we can execute it multiple times. Many of you might be looking at this and saying, hey, that looks very similar to a scope. And why don't we just use scopes? And we can't do that because people expect that scopes are executed multiple times, where this block is only executed once. For example, you might have a scope that's like, give me all of the comments for today. Uh, well, you probably wouldn't be happy if today was the same day every single day. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be very fun. The other thing is that the cache key is extremely easy. So I think if we introduce a new API like that, the cache key is extremely easy, plus you get to keep using the nice relation API. Relation API is maintained. So the next thing I want to talk about is speeding up helpers. Like, that was all active record stuff, um, and I'm pretty, after three years of doing that stuff, I'm pretty burnt out on active record. Uh, so I'm looking, at, I'm looking at speeding up helpers and more of the view end side. So this is, like, this is stuff I've been working on very recently. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to do is reduce uh, object allocations. So I was, doing pro I was profiling request and response time like I was showing earlier, and I want to look at, look at a little bit of that. What I did is I said, okay, here's our test code. Again, we're creating a new, creating a new uh, application here. Running, running one request through it, running stackprof against that. And what I found is that I'm running stackprof, the tool that we looked at earlier. I wanted to see, look at bottlenecks in our rendering system. So what I found is, I found uh, our benchmarks look like this, or our results look like this. At the very top there, we have this object called active, active support safe buffer initialize. That is the very top line. It's chewing up about 9% of our processing speed every time, so we're calling initialize a lot. So I said, okay, where are we calling active support safe buffer initialize? I need to be able to find this. How did I find this? So one thing I use is I use a tool called TracePoint that's in Ruby 2.1. I'm not sure when it was introduced, but it's in later versions of Ruby. And I use this code to say, okay, every time, every time we get a call, uh, I check to see if the call is on the active support safe buffer class and if the method is initialized. If it's that class and initialize, I'm gonna say, give me the call stack. Tell me what the call stack is. I get the binding and a val caller. I'm sure Koichi is cringing at my code. This is really super terrible. But I say, okay, give me the caller. And down here below, those two, those two lines at the very bottom are our tests. So we can see what the actual output, like, output is from this. And if we look at the output, we'll see, okay, uh, we have two calls from that. One is inside the HTML safe method and the other one is actually inside our test script on line 13. So I found that inside of Rails, this is, this is actually our test script, and where I found these inside of Rails, in Rails I found them inside this method called the tag options method, and what the tag options method is, is it's a helper method that generates the actual, the attributes inside your tags. So, I don't know, any, any of the attributes that are inside your tags, and it actually comes from inside this erbutil.h. Uh, method. 
In order to talk about this, I should hurry along. I have a million, billion slides left. Okay, so let's talk about HTML sanitization in Rails very quickly. Um, HTML sanitization works with an, a, with an active support safe buffer. So if we look at an ordinary string in Rails, we'll say like, okay, we check the string, the string type, we ask if it's HTML safe, it says false. The safe buffer, if we use a safe buffer, we say like, okay, give me an HTML safe version of this string, we get back a safe buffer, we ask, is that HTML safe? It says true. So an important thing to note here is that HTML safe just tags the string. If you say, if you say string .html safe, what you are saying is, I am okay for these bytes to be output across the wire without being escaped, okay? It does not mean that it is safe. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the name, it does not mean that it is safe, it just means that we will not, Rails will not escape it when we send it out across the wire. So what does erbutils h do, do? What that does is it says, okay, if the string is not HTML safe, then we'll gsub it, we'll say like, okay, let's escape everything, and then we'll call HTML safe on that and return to you an active support safe buffer. And what happens here is we're actually creating two different strings. A safe buffer is a subclass of a Ruby string. So we say, okay, we do a G sub, that creates the string, a new string object with the escaped code in it, and then we create an active support safe buffer here. So it actually creates two strings. So how does this relate to tag options? If we go back and look at tag options, we assign the return value of that to this, we say, okay, escape it, we get it back here into value, and then we actually interpolate it down here into another string. So what's happening is, we're taking a string, we're generating a string, we're generating a safe buffer, then we're generating another string. It's like, so many objects everywhere. So I was wondering to myself, what is the point of generating the safe buffer if we're just gonna interpolate it back into a straight up Ruby string? We can remove this safe buffer. We can remove that completely. So we ended up extracting that and say like, okay, let's just do string to string to string. <laughs> I guess it's better. <laughs> it's one better. <laughs> anyway, so we extract a method say like, okay, unwrapped HTML escape. We extracted the inside of HTML escape to say like, okay, let's just have a method that escapes the string but doesn't return a safe buffer. So we just say, we just do the G sub and then we're still backwards compatible. The original method calls this unwrapped HTML and then, and then set, calls HTML safe on it. Then we update our callers to just call the unwrapped version. Call the unwrapped version, gets assigned a value, value gets interpolated and now we're just doing string to string to string to string. So, what happened was we were looking at about 200 allocations per request, 200 string allocations per request for, or this saved about 200 allocations per request for books.new. What this is is just a scaffold page. What I'm testing here is a scaffold, if you had generated a book scaffold and you're looking at that particular form. So that alone saved 200 allocations per request. And if we look at our request benchmark, it looks like this. The way that I benchmarked this is I said, okay, we do exactly the same warm up. Uh, we're, we're requesting books.new, warm up here, using allocation tracer here to get the number of, uh, number of allocations per request. And if we break this down by object type, we can see this is what our, this is what our object type allocations look like across versions. So blue is 4.0 stable, green is 4.1 stable, and then whatever that orangey thing is, is master. So you can see our number one problem is t-strings. We're reducing these, we're reducing these objects as time goes on, so we're improving, we're improving Rails here. And this, I, this graph doesn't look super impressive, but remember, it's a 19% reduction since 4.0 stable, remember that, that's very large, so is 14% reduction since 4.1 stable, I'm very happy about this. Now unfortunately, unfortunately, with this particular change, your mileage may vary. So I said like, what we were talking about here is string buffer allocations inside of tag options. And obviously this depends on what your HTML looks like. So I can tell you that this, this saved us 19%, 19 of the strings uh, for this particular page. But what it does for your application, I'm not sure. Like if you're just generating JSON, this will save you nothing. But if you're actually generating an HTML page, it may save you a lot depending on what your, your HTML looks like. So the next thing I wanna talk about is string object reduction, like what happened between 4.0 and 4.1? We didn't talk about that. Now, oh man, so many slides. Let's go through this quickly. All right, so, 
So I get extremely nervous before my talks, and I just think like, okay, if I add more slides, everything will be okay. <laughs> I'm extremely paranoid. I'll get up in front of everybody, take like 10 minutes and be like, I'm sorry. <laughs> but now I have millions of slides. Okay, so in Ruby we have mutable strings and what that means is that every time we evaluate this block we get a new object allocated. This is very apparent. Look at these object IDs. They're different every time that block executes. It shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. But what's really cool is in later versions of Ruby, I think it was introduced in 2.1, there is now a compiler trick in there that says if we freeze the strings, we actually get just one object back. So you can't mutate, you can't mutate that string anyway. So what we said is okay, uh, every time the compiler comes across a string literal with a dot freeze on it, we're just gonna return the same object to you every time. We won't allocate a new object every time that's evaluated and you can see that the object IDs are the same every time. So the way we took advantage of this in Rails is if you look at ERB templates, we have stuff, this is an example ERB template. Here is a compiled template that I, a compiled version of te the template that I want you to read extremely closely. <laughs> that is a joke. Uh, so this is the compiled version of the template. We took the ERB and compiled it down into Ruby code. And if we look at that, if we zoom in on it, we'll see something that looks like this. We have a string literal there that's the actual HTML, that TR or that TD that we had in the ERB. It's the HTML literal. And what's interesting about this is you can't mutate it. It's never mutated. Template literals can't change. So what we did for 4.1, we, me, I'm not sure if anybody noticed I did this. I noticed I did it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we added freeze in there. So these string literals are now frozen. So the HTML literal is frozen and we actually reduce, that's where these savings came from the 4.0 to 4.1. That's how we reduce that there. The next thing that, we're do that I'm looking at is speeding up output. And I want to warn you, this is a work in progress. Um, the code I'm going to talk about does not exist on master today. It exists on my machine. So hopefully my machine does not die. Um, or maybe I should push a branch somewhere, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, so I'm gonna talk about how the law of Demeter is helping us speed up our code. And really this is just a, I think this is just a suggestion of Demeter. I don't like that it's called law of Demeter because it's like, if you screw that up, it's like somebody gonna come along and arrest you from breaking the law. Uh, well, it turns out in the United States they will. <laughs> And then I wondered to myself, like, so if you get arrested for, if you get arrested for violating the law of the meter, does that mean you're doing arrested development? <laughs> uh, so to me, like, I'm not sure exactly what the, what the definition of uh, law of the meter is. Like, I'm not, I'm totally not sure about it. I know it's like, like, you don't want to have too many dots or something. Like, if you're calling too many methods down, then you're doing something wrong, which is probably true, but the way I look at it is, it's not about the dots, it's about the types that your function handles. Um, so, like, what I think is that the, the fewer types that your function actually handles, uh, the faster and easier your code is gonna end up being. So what I mean by that is, we'll look at this compiled template again that you can totally read very well, and we see this, we have this HTML literal here again. What's interesting about this is if we go look at the safe append method, that safe append equals method, and why there is an equal sign there, I have no idea. <laughs> Super stupid. We should probably remove that. But if we look at this, it's, it has a line there. Look at that line. It says return self if value dot nil. Why? Guess what value can never ever be? It can never be nil. The ERB compiler guarantees that this will never be nil. So why are we doing this? Why is that there? We don't need to handle nil. This is a type that we don't need to deal with. So we just say like, I don't care about nil. I don't handle it. If you pass a nil to me, whatever. I don't care. So we just remove that. We don't handle nils. Just delete that. Why are we doing this runtime check? We're checking that every single time. Your ERB templates, every time you have that HTML literal, we're checking whether or not that's nil. It, what a waste. It's a huge waste. So I have to realize that that's, that probably wasn't actually law of the meter. That was, I think that was actually more defensive programming, but um, my joke would not have worked with defensive programming. <laughs> so I used law of the meter. Uh, now the other thing that we're working on with this is this output buffer, this thing that it's appending to, happens to be a subclass of, uh, 
God, this kills me, happens to be a subclass of safe buffer that we were looking at earlier, which is also a subclass of string. Now, if you look at safe append in the superclass, it's saying, hey, if I'm not HTML safe, if this safe buffer is not HTML safe, then do something special. But this can only happen. This, this conditional only returns true if the safe buffer has ever been mutated. Well, it turns out that you can't actually get access to the output buffer. We don't give you access to that, which means that you can never mutate the output buffer. You can never make this conditional will never return true. It'll always be HTML safe. So why do we have that? It kills me. I look at this, I'm like, how can you, how can you even get to the output buffer? I look at this, I'm like, I look through Rails, I'm like, how, do we, how can you get access? Who mutates it? And I think the answer is no one. So we should be able to just reduce this conditional to that. So if I could sum this up, what I think that you should be doing in your applications in order to increase speed, caching invariance, any time that you can find a calculation that you're doing over and over again, it always ends up being the same. You should cache it. Eliminate objects. Um, and where this comes in is no code is faster than no code. If we can delete code, it's going to be faster. Uh, limit types. <laughs> limit the types that your functions handle. Like, if you can reduce the number of the types of objects that your functions handle, it'll make your code, you'll have less code. And just as we learned a few slides earlier, less code is equal to faster code. And the other thing that I want you to do is, now that I've taught you about all of these performance tools, all of these tools that you can use to uh, test the performance of your Rails application, report performance issues to us, please. That dip, when we were looking at those, those graphs, that dip from 2.3 down to 3.0 and 3.1, that should never have happened. I, it should never have happened, in my opinion. And I think the reason is that nobody was measuring their applications. Nobody was saying, like, hey, people were like, ah, Rails seems slow. It's gotten slower. And I hate it when people do that. They say, the reason I hate it is because saying something like Rails is slower is not helpful to me. So you say to me, Aaron, Rails is slower. I'm like, cool. <laughs> I'll just go speed up Rails. I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so <laughs> if you can tell me what is slower, we can make it faster. So I actually heard this, I, it warmed my heart. I heard yesterday that GitHub was finally upgrading to Rails 3.0, and I know that they had tried this a long time ago. They were upgrading to Rails 3, and I talked to my friends that worked there, and I said, well, why couldn't you upgrade? And they said, well, it's slower. And I'm like, what's slower? No response. Thanks, <laughs> I'll, I'll get right on that. <laughs> anyway, Rails 4.2 will be the fastest Rails ever, I think. I think this will be the fastest Rails ever. I'm confident saying that. So thank you. Uh, if you have any questions about this stuff, like I don't know if we have time. I'm a little bit over an hour. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be at the party later, so please come say hello to me. I will give you a sticker. We can talk about performance issues eh, or whatever. You can just say Rails is slower, and I'll still laugh. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Aaron. Um, any questions for him? Don't be shy. I am not always in Singapore to answer questions. <laughs> yes. Can I talk? Oh, yeah. Um, so, so you showed a few things you think are bad DSL or. API design choices in, in Rails. Like, so if in Rails 5 you could uh, pull your, your veto card and get rid of something, what, what, what would it be? You think I have a veto card? <laughs> yeah, I don't have that. Uh, if I could pull something from Rails 5, what would it be? Um, oh, I have no idea. I can't even tell you. Well, actually, some of the stuff like, we provide, we have some methods for doing introspection into active record. I wish that we could remove those because some of those things just don't make sense, but people like, uh, for example, one of the things I broke is that somebody would say iterating through all the reflections on active record looking for has and belongs to many ones. And now that has and belongs to many is implemented in terms of has many throughs, these didn't show up anymore. So I broke their code. 
If I could remove some of this introspection stuff, I think that might help. Uh, the other things I'd like to do is, um, honestly, the next thing I'm working, the things that I really want to get rid of are things that impact thread safety, really. I can't give you anything super specific now, but anything that impacts thread safety, I'd like to remove. So globals. <laughs> I know that's not super specific, but <laughs> I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I had a question. Yes. Yeah. So uh, on those uh, performance graphs, was that all with the same version of Ruby? Yes, it was. Okay. Have you uh, tried it with uh, a, a new version of Ruby just to see what the garbage collector does? Uh, that was with the newest. That was with Trunk Ruby. OK. Um, but so all those tests were performed with Trunk Ruby. Um, they should be, the graphs should probably be similar on any particular version of Ruby. Maybe not exactly the same numbers, but still the same percentage increase. Hi, Aaron. Hey. All, all your slides spoke about performance improvement, but after master you also had adequate. You yes. Talk a little more about that. Uh, so I originally named this project Adequate Record after my consulting company, Adequate. We do everything adequately. <laughs> Uh, we have just enough clients, so don't ask me to <laughs> do work. Uh, no, we named so we named it after we named I named it after that, um, and now that it's been merged back into Master, uh, it's dead. So Master is it. All those numbers are from Master. So most of the performance improvements are actually in adequate adequate record, and it's or just is that separate gem anymore? No, no, no. Um, adequate is just the branch name. It's actually all of it was just merged back into master. So it's all there is. There is no such thing as adequate anymore. It's not adequate. <laughs> it's it's just Rails. And, and this is the first time I'm seeing you informally dressed. What happened to your suit? What happened to my suit? I'll tell you what happened to my suit is like extremely hot temperatures and high humidity is what happened to my suit. <laughs> I would I would die up here if I was wearing that. <laughs> right, thanks. Uh, so does does the Rails core team have? Is there any discussion around uh, automated uh, performance regression tests? So. Um, yeah, we've talked about so we've talked about that, but some of the problems are like. So theoretically, we have performance tests. We do have performance tests, but they test things like, uh, I, if I remember correctly, they only test active record stuff. And uh, we never look at the output. So uh, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't super help very much. And we don't have historical data. We don't have historical data for them either. So we don't know across particular branches. As far as I know, like uh, the stuff that I've showed you all here is the most comprehensive, most comprehensive performance tests backwards in time. Uh, we've talked about another problem is we can do, another problem with uh, doing performance tests like that is API, API stability. So like uh, when I was showing you controller performance tests from 4.1 and, or 4.0, 4.1 and master, I actually couldn't show them to you for 3.2 and 3.1 because the API changes in Rails made it such that I would have to do major work on my benchmarks in order to show you those tests over time. So uh, the answer is yes, we've talked about it, and it is hard. But if someone can come up with a good idea, like, <laughs> please, <laughs> we'd love to have that. Uh, I saw a talk of yours at some point, and you were talking about actually uh, submitting uh, prepared statements so that the database could, uh, could cache the query plan. And I was wondering, I think at the time, you guys decided not to do that uh, in active record? Is that? That is not true. We do that. That is not true. OK, yes, cool. Yes, we do that. Uh, we, do, we do do prepared statements, and you can shut them off if you don't want to use them. But we do them by default, except on MySQL. Um, yeah. We can talk about that. We can talk about how awesome MySQL is at the party. Hello. I know, you're, I know you're a little shy, but I think your performance is fantastic. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Can we give it up for uh, Aaron again? Thank you.